Lecture 30, Clusters and Cloud Computing. All right, up till this point, everything that we have talked about, or at least close to it, uh, has been based around the idea of making things faster, improving performance on a single computer. At some point, however, uh, this ceases to be the best option. Uh, and uh, you know, why, why does this happen? Well, um, you know, the, uh, the thing is, well, we can take advantage of threads. We can take advantage of compiler optimizations. Uh, we've even talked about how to use the GPU uh, in, in a way to uh, get some more performance for the right kind of problem. But of course, not every kind of problem. However, um, to get a lot of bandwidth, uh, you will eventually need more than one computer. Uh, or you will just reach a point where it's better value for your money to buy two cheap computers instead of one very expensive computer. Right? You know, if, if you want to have you know, 32 cores or something, I mean, you can probably buy a 32 core processor, um, but you might find it's cheaper to buy two 16 core processors, uh, and you can see sort of how it goes from there. Uh, you know, the uh, more expensive the uh, the part, uh, the more likely it is that you could get something seemingly equivalent from you know, having two of them that are slower but cheaper. Um, obviously, that increases bandwidth uh, and you know, is not necessarily as good for latency. You may need, in fact, a you know, very fast CPU uh, and a very expensive CPU if you really want to decrease latency. Um, but, you know, uh, not necessarily. Sometimes uh, your best bet is just to increase bandwidth. Anyway, we're going to uh, start moving into the discussion about having multiple computers involved. Um, we'll survey some of the techniques that are associated with this. Uh, this is not a substitute for a class you know, distributed computing, but um, we're going to touch on some things that may have been mentioned uh, in that course if you took it. Uh, if not, don't worry. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing in here where you, know, you absolutely have to have taken it, uh, although it may provide some context for some of the things uh, that we are talking about. With that said, um, let's get going. Um, so yeah, uh, more and more and more. Uh, and from here out to the rest of the course, we are going to be thinking about, well, how do we take advantage of multiple computers? Uh, and how do we make good decisions about how many we're going to need? Uh, which, is, uh, which is one of the other important questions that we will try to answer very soon. Um, but for now, we're going to talk about how would they interact. You know, we'll, we'll build our way up to saying, all right, you know, go rent a bunch of servers from Amazon. First, we'll talk about you know, what, what do we need to do on our application to make it work. Um, Rust encourages message passing, uh, and perhaps a lot of your previous experience has been with you know, a shared memory kind of system, uh, particularly in a language like C. Uh, which doesn't quite encourage message passing quite to the same degree. Um, and really, it's not specifically that you know, one of those strategies is wrong and you know, you're wrong for using it. Uh, however, the message passing strategy makes it a lot easier to transition to a you know, communicating over the network scenario uh, than message passing. Sometimes, as we know, we have no choice. Um, if you want to do um, GPU programming, uh, we have to explicitly manage the copying of data, uh, in which case, yeah, absolutely, that's uh, you know, got to be explicit. Uh, similarly, if you are doing inter-process communication between uh, your processes running on the same machine, you could have uh, you know, always done it using network uh, communication, you know, open sockets and communicate via sockets. That's always been an option, and you could. Uh, and the nice thing about that is it makes it possible, you know, one day in the future to move uh, one of the processes to another machine without really having to change very much. Um, maybe you did that, maybe you didn't. Nevertheless, um, when we get to a scenario when we are communicating over the network, uh, and that is you know, a scenario we may reach eventually, uh, communication becomes a lot more expensive. It takes a lot longer to transmit data over the network than it does to communicate within the same machine. You know, shared memory is very fast. Um, even uh, uh, working within the same uh, local area network uh, can be very fast. 
However, when we are talking to a server and the server is located in a you know, Frankfurt-based data center and you know, we're over in California, you know, the speed of light implies a certain limitation that um, we can't really get around, at least not yet. I mean, we're working on it, but we're not there yet. So that means it is important to think carefully about how much to communicate and what to communicate because every uh, every communication is going to you know, add up to eventually making the program slower so we should only do it when we absolutely need all right uh, there was a time uh, when we would talk about MPI uh, the message passing interface uh, which was a uh, de facto standard for uh, programming using uh, well multi-computer systems and you know there was message passing and uh, in, in message passing, we would talk about um, things like, well, you, know, you set up ranks and uh, you know, develop your algorithm and you hand it out to the uh, different, uh, different workers and workers return results which are collected by rank zero. We don't do that anymore. Uh, MPI, uh, well, is, is not the way. Um, in the notes, there's a detailed piece uh, that uh, talks about the relevance of MPI. Um, but basically, um, yeah, M MPI, uh, well, nobody's hiring for it, apparently. A very low percentage of job postings uh, are, are for it. Um, and um, MPI was originally kind of successful. Um, you know, it, it did get started, but uh, you know, it's not changed very much over the last 25 years. Um, and well, I mean, if if you uh, take take the uh, author's opinion on it uh, and uh, break it down, it's basically that MPI is at the wrong level of abstraction, where uh, every exchange of data has to be you know, implemented with handcrafted sends and receives or get and put, uh, which is kind of awkward for uh, application developers who might want to think in terms of arrays or trees or hash tables or something like that. Um, so that's uh, that's part of the problem. Uh, it's also not great for tool builders because, uh, well, you know, uh, in, any library uh, that w wants to implement it um, you know, has uh, got to face the fact that you know other programming languages just have that kind of stuff built in, uh, and uh, that other uh, implementations bypass the MPI layer to have better performance, um, and uh, yeah, the the author's post is very long, um, but just reading through the summary, uh, it's more than you need for simple parallelism, but much less than you need for uh, extreme parallelism, uh, and you know the the uh, tool hasn't really kept up with uh, uh, hasn't really kept up with things. So anyway, we don't talk about MPI anymore. This uh, little digression into why it's uh, why it's no longer popular and why it's no longer the way is interesting and so uh, I think reading that article is probably worthwhile but uh, you know you don't have to um, it's not strictly necessary um, but I think anyway uh, it gives you kind of an insight into what makes sense uh, and what doesn't in terms of a distributed computing system we'll move on for now all right um, what about say um, rest hey, this is a thing that we've probably already seen and probably already done. Uh, I mean, we already had some of it in the course. We did asynchronous I.O. using HTTP with curl, uh, which we could use to consume a REST API as one mechanism for multi-computer uh, communication. Uh, and that worked. Uh, you know, it was a part of an assignment, uh, and uh, you know, we, I imagine, have uh, at least some experience with REST APIs uh, somewhere else, maybe in a capstone design project. Uh, you've implemented something like that. Uh, you may have also learned about sockets. Uh, if you took something like EC252, we talked about sockets. We've learned about them. Um, and we've uh, also uh, perhaps touched on the subject a couple of times since then. Sockets are really low level and uh, perhaps too low level for our purpose. Um, it's, it requires way too much sort of explicit work. Uh, and it's unlikely that you would, in a high-level language, want to write 
a lot of stuff using sockets if you could avoid it you would probably rather uh, use you know, rest api because it's an appropriate level of abstraction so let's do that um, rest apis are often completely synchronous but they don't have to be uh, when you are consuming an api you can you know, set up a callback and uh, you know, have the uh, if the information sent to you when it's ready, uh, alternatively, you can submit something and then check again when it is ready. Uh, and all those things are you know, fairly straightforward as a way of communicating between uh, different machines. However, when you're doing that, you are requiring that the remote machine be available at the time of the call. Uh, otherwise, you can't you know, communicate with them. Um, and that is a strategy you can do this um, but maybe you want to decouple things a little bit more than that I mean, uh, requiring that the service always be available is you know, sometimes reasonable and sometimes not uh, and decoupling it a bit might actually make things a little bit better so let's talk about uh, the Apache project Kafka a uh, self-described distributed streaming platform uh, that has significant adoption in industry uh, as a mechanism for communication between different services running over a network. Uh, and you, know, you publish messages to Kafka and they are picked up by people who are interested in receiving them and that's you know, at the highest level how the model works. Um, so communication is based on the idea of you know, producers, uh, they are writing a record. A record is just a data element. Uh, a data element is like an invoice, for example, um, or you know, customer data uh, into a topic. Uh, and topics are used to categorize messages. All right, straightforward so far. Uh, and consumers take the item from the topic uh, and are hopefully doing something useful with it. A message remains available for a fixed period of time and could potentially be replayed if you need it. Um, and um, this is a, a publish subscribe model. I think we've talked about the idea of the producer consumer problem uh, to the point where you're sick of it. Uh, and you've probably also covered something like the publish subscribe model as well. So you know, the idea of channels, topics, subscriptions, that kind of thing also doesn't need me to spend a lot of time repeating it. Uh, so we can skip over that. Uh, but each client has its own view of what things it's consumed from the topic, so you don't necessarily uh, have to consume it as soon as it's published. You can come back to it later and, and catch up on, you know, here's what I've missed so far. Uh, and that works uh, as uh, a way of having each consumer coordinate itself. How does this work uh, a little behind the scenes? Well, Kafka is based on a strategy of writing things into an immutable log, uh, and the log is split into different partitions. Uh, and you can choose how many partitions you want when creating the topic, and uh, this allows you to set the level of parallelism that you want to support. Uh, obviously, more partitions means more parallelism, uh, and that will be uh, you know, a trade-off. So consumers read from each of the partitions and they keep track of their respective progress within the partitions. So in the diagram here for the same topic, we have three partitions uh, and messages get written into the various partitions and uh, clients keep track of, all right, for this topic on partition one, uh, I've read thus far up to number seven. So when it, uh, it being the client wants to read uh, the next item, it will go and you know, fetch it from the partitions, keeping track of what it's done already. So it'll say, aha, in partition zero, I'm caught up. But in partition one, I've only read up to number seven. So I will now take item eight and you know, item nine if it's, if it's been created. Uh, and that's how we do it. And that's how they consume. Consumers could reset their offset if they want. So if you want to reconsume the objects that are in the topic, you can actually do that. Uh, you can um, just you know, choose to change your offset back to zero and uh, you know, that resets it and uh, problem solved. You've got uh, everything over from the beginning again. Well, you know, beginning being relative, I suppose, uh, because uh, data is not necessarily kept forever. Uh, it's just kept for as long as the retention policy says. Um, and so, yep, yeah, they... Uh, 
messages are removed from the topic based on their expiry, um, which is a big advantage over uh, some other strategies where it's very important to remove items from the queue as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, the um, in a you know standard queue, there's a little bit of pressure to um, take items out of the queue quickly, uh, because queues are rarely of infinite size. There is a limit to how much you can keep in the queue, and basically, if you, you know, leave things in there for a very long time, the queue risks getting full. Uh, and when it's full, there's a potential for messages to get lost. You know, you drop them because you're not accepting new ones, or you throw away old ones. So I, either way. Uh, somebody might be unhappy that a message that they wanted doesn't uh, doesn't end up being consumed. Um, so that's okay. Um, you, you, uh, if the queue is growing, um, you can you know just provision it to be larger. Maybe that costs money though. Uh, you know, if it's uh, storage space. Uh, it's you know not infinite and not free, uh, and uh, you probably want to save some money. Uh, you think you might be able to um, get around this by saying, "Look, you know, I, I'm not ready to consume a message right now. But what I want to do is, you know, just take all the messages I can get, and I'm going to write them down, and I'm going to process them later." Uh, and that is a possibility as long as you are saving them in a persistent way. Uh, you're not just holding them in an in-memory queue. Because you know, if you um, hold them in memory queue and you know there's a crash uh, or a shutdown is called for your application, then you don't end up processing those messages because you took them out of the queue and you said, "Look, uh, I'm going to handle this," and then you didn't because you know there was a crash. Uh, but if you have them persistently saved uh, in the database, you can say, "Yep, I've got it. Uh, I will just uh, take it on when I restart." All right. Um, there's a couple of other alternatives that I want to mention uh, that are uh, also possibilities for uh, communication between your different uh, servers or different services. Um, these are AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services based solutions. Um, talking about them is not like a you know endorsement where I say you know these are the best and you should use them. Uh, they're just some alternatives that we could cover. Um, AWS is popular enough that you may have uh, given some of their services a try. Uh, I speculate the answer to that is yes. Uh, and um, it is just to give you a little bit of differentiation versus the Kafka approach. Uh, and the two that we're going to talk about are SNS, uh, Simple Notification Service, and SQS, Simple Queuing Service. Uh, and they are just you know, simple ways of decoupling the communication of your programs. Uh, and we're not going to go into them in great detail. I'll just tell you uh, about the uh, differences between them. Uh, and SNS is good for sending messages to multiple receivers, something like uh, push notifications where you know, you're sending a message to people and saying, you know, hey, here's something that I think you should know. Um, you could use it to make sure that all systems update their records. You know, hey, you know, this company has changed. Oh, please, please get this. Uh, you can send pager alerts to people uh, if something has gone wrong. Uh, you know, if uh, if you're using that for um, you know, operations team stuff, you know, you're managing the uh, operations by saying to uh, people, you know, watch your phone if you get a text uh, you know, that something is wrong and you need to deal with it. You can do it with that. Um, SNS messages are not persistent, so if you miss it, you miss it. If uh, somebody is not consuming that message at, at the moment, um, you know they they miss it, and usually that's okay. Um, SQS, on the other hand, uh, is more for batches of work where it's not particularly time sensitive, uh, and you just want an item to eventually be consumed by a worker. Uh, it's again really just focused on the idea of decoupling things. Um, that is, you you put it in the queue, and somebody will take it out of the queue. Uh, and you know, in a producer-consumer scenario, it's not super important to you as the producer who the consumer is and when they consume it. Uh, as long as it happens sooner rather than later. 
Um, and uh, SQS data is deleted uh, after being taken out of the queue, uh, and you have your option about whether there are ordering guarantees uh, on your SQS queue. Uh, the default is no. Um, you know, with additional difficulty, it can give you some ordering guarantees. Uh, if that's important, if it's just you know updates about companies, you know, it doesn't matter very much whether they don't update of you know, company 12 comes before or after the update of company 11, um, but it might be uh, of interest to you uh, if there is a reason why these things have to happen in order. Okay, um, we're going to move on then to you know the idea of cloud computing in a little more uh, detail. Uh, and now that we have uh, a, a conception of how different uh, things will communicate uh, in a, a cloud computing scenario, we can spend a minute to talk about cloud computing in general. Uh, and uh, I read somewhere, uh, it might have been a Reddit comment, where somebody said, I, I wrote a script that replaces the cloud everywhere I see it with, you know, someone else's computer, uh, which is, um, well, it's not wrong. Uh, I guess that makes it hard if you're ever looking up the weather, um, you know, uh, but uh, a price they're probably willing to pay. You know, oh, there's someone else's computer in the sky today. Yes. Definitely correct. Uh, not not a uh, substitution error. Don't know what you're talking about. Okay, um, the cloud really is just someone else's computer. Um, in history, we've, you know, we didn't always do this. Uh, you know, previously you would you know find a budget, you know, pitch to your manager. We need some new servers, and you know, you get some authorized budget to to buy some some servers. Okay, you, you do, uh, and. Uh, you you purchase them. You uh, maybe don't assemble them yourself, or maybe you do. Um, you know, it's it's not too difficult, and some people even consider it kind of fun, uh, maybe even a little relaxing. Uh, and, you know, you, so you purchase the machines uh, and you put them together, and you, uh, you know, take them to your uh, data center and you install them and you maintain them. Okay, um, we rarely do that anymore. Uh, a lot of a lot of the time, it's not worth our while to do that kind of work slash maintenance, uh, and it is in fact better to um, just rent some servers. You know, go go to uh, Amazon and say, "Hey, Amazon, would you you know take some money uh, in exchange for renting some servers?" And they will say, "Yes, we will gladly take your money." Uh, and Google has the compute cloud. Um, Azure is the Microsoft one. Um, you know, you, you're not uh, limited in any sense by. Uh, uh, by the uh, Amazon approach, uh, it's just something that we'll talk about here for the sake of an example, because we're going to reference it a little later again as well. Um, but the uh, the idea is the same regardless of which provider you are using. Okay, um, in the past, um, you know we. Uh, we got here via you know, this evolution process, and in the beginning, uh, if you wanted a server on the internet, um, you, know, you want to host a website or something like that, well, you have to get a physical machine and you, know, you host it in a rack somewhere. Uh, and eventually, people came up with the idea of, well, we could sh sell shared hosting, you know, where we host a lot of websites on the same machine. Uh, and that would be okay because you know, most of the websites of the time were not particularly demanding in terms of you know, uh, compute resources, so it wasn't very hard to host more than one of them on the same server at a time. Uh, shared hosting came with various limitations. You know, you can't run arbitrary stuff on there. You know, it's really intended for running just you know your website, uh, and your website might be able to do a couple of fancy things. But you know, do you want a database? You know, grudgingly, we'll support it, but it's also a shared database, so you have very few performance guarantees, things like that. Then um, we got into virtualization, uh, and virtualization m means you could pay for you know, a part of the machine. You know, the, the one physical machine is now running several virtual machines, uh, and that allows you more control over what you want to run. Um, you know, none of the hosts are likely uh, maxing out the computer. Uh, and so sharing it is you know, better, uh, you know, and you get uh, good security guarantees as a result of the virtualization. And uh, you also get um, the ability to you know, install arbitrary software. Uh, you get you know, root access or close to it uh, on the machine, uh, which was better than you know, in the shared hosting scenario where you can just you know, modify things in your home directory uh, and you can't really run an arbitrary process. So that's good. 
Uh, and then going one up from that is uh, cloud computing, where instead of you know, virtualization where you get one machine and so uh, go with it, uh, with cloud computing, you can spin up uh, as many as you need. That could be one, it could be a dozen, it could be a thousand. Uh, and when you need more compute capacity, you can just you know turn them on and off and say, you know, here are, we're going to add additional capacity by starting up 10 servers if, you know, uh, if we find that application... Uh, is running slowly and uh, more nodes, more power. Excellent. Um, you can also have these uh, servers share a persistent storage that is also in the cloud. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know, on the same machine, uh, making it a lot easier if you want to uh, start them up and shut them down. That you, They don't have to have you know, new configuration uh, and you don't have to figure out a way to copy their data before they uh, shut down or you know, initialize them with good data before they start. So in cloud computing, you pay uh, according to the number of instances that you have set up uh, and you uh, make choices uh, about, say, the, um, the resources that it has. Um, and sometimes they come in a package where you say, you know, the, um, the uh, this package contains this much CPU, this much RAM, this much uh, GPU, those kinds of things. But basically you want more of anything, it costs more money, GPU costs more money uh, than, uh, uh, than just having a CPU system because you know, the cards, I guess, are expensive. Um, and yeah, uh, I did at some point do some math on whether it would be sort of economical to um, just rent uh, some GPU servers uh, for the GPU assignment. Um, we, that did not appear to be economic uh, at the time, at least in previous years. Uh, so instead, uh, the department uh, put some money into the ECE Tesla machines. Uh, I think it's... Uh, in the long run, probably going to be the case that it won't be uh, economical for uh, the department to maintain you know, the EC Ubuntu servers and that it will be easier just to you know, spin up instances as you need. But at least in the short term, uh, it seems to be the case that uh, it is worth our while to keep them around. So that's what we've got for now. All right. Um, and so when you need more power, you just launch more instances and... Uh, Obviously, your application has to be designed such that you know there can be multiple nodes uh, for this to work, but that's okay. Uh, and when you launch an instance, you say this is the virtual machine image that I want, uh, and you know you spend some time to configure that before you launch it. Uh, and you get a command line or web-based tool to launch that instance. After you launch the instance, it gets an IP address uh, and is network accessible, and you get root access. Um, Amazon uh, provides you some uh, public images uh, based on whatever base operating system you want. So you can make it uh, you know, have um, Linux, um, Windows Server, Open Solaris. You can also build an image that has whatever software you want. Uh, you know, in just install what you need and then save that image and use it as your deployment. Uh, and you know, if if you need Hadoop, Open MPI, anything like that, just you know, put it in there. No. No big deal, no issue. Um, presumably, though, uh, you don't want to pay forever for your instances. Uh, when you don't need them anymore, you just shut them down, uh, and that's it. Uh, you know, any, anything that is you know, on that instance goes away. So anything that's you know, in local temporary storage or in memory, or what have you, will be lost at that point. So you do want to save things to persistent storage, uh, of course. But uh, you know, when you don't need it anymore, shut it down and stop paying for it. Uh, which is the advantage of this, right? You spin up a machine, you use it only for the time that you need, uh, and then you just shut it down when you don't need it, and you didn't pay for a time you don't need. Um, so to keep the persistent results, uh, of course, you need to uh, mount a storage device um, like uh, Amazon Elastic Block Storage, um, connect to a database, um, Amazon Simple DB Relational Database Storage, uh, you can store things in S3 as well. Uh, all of those things are perfectly good options for um, keeping your data somewhere. Uh, most likely, you're probably going to put it you know, in the uh, in a database, but uh, you know, uh, it's it's really up to you. you know, make make the decision that makes the most sense for your scenario. Okay, um, the. Uh, 
last thing that I uh, want to cover here is the idea of, well, clusters versus laptops. Uh, and this references a uh, paper from uh, 2015 that says, uh, well, you know, scalability, but at what cost? Uh, and uh, the idea is effectively that, uh, yes, yeah, scalability is important, uh, and you do want to be able to take advantage uh, of multiple nodes uh, and have lots of um, lots of compute power, but um, scaling to a big data type system introduces a significant amount of overhead uh, and we should do a little bit of comparison to see how a laptop compares you know in absolute times to a 128 core big data system uh, and uh, big data systems have not necessarily been shown to be obviously good uh, you know, it may be advantageous to use one but it won't be in a hundred percent of the cases uh, for that reason, we need to stop and think about whether it is useful in the case that we are discussing. Um, the important metric is not just scalability, because the absolute performance matters a lot. Uh, and what we don't want is scaling up to end systems to introduce so much overhead that we are spending all of the resources on dealing with the complexity of scaling up. Uh, or as Oscar Wilde put it, the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. Uh, and the methodology that we use to check our work is comparing a single threaded implementation versus a big data system. Uh, that you may have a um, you may have a big data system that you can uh, test with. Uh, in this case, we're going to do uh, page rank. Uh, this is part of what makes Google successful, uh, and uh, it's a graph processing algorithm. Uh, and in this, the uh, bottleneck is uh, is label propagation, uh, which uh, is uh, when we are doing page rank, we are assigning labels to things, and we have to communicate those between the various nodes. Uh, and the data set that we're going to test with is uh, a graph with some uh, few billion edges, uh, which amounts to a few gigabytes of data. Uh, and um, here's, the, uh, here's the results based on it. Uh, and uh, we can see there are a few different uh, systems, including a sort of a thringle, single thread system. Uh, and uh, the single thread uses one core, and the other ones use 128 cores. Uh, and we'll find, uh, as we go about this, uh, so in particular looking at the uh, page rank iterations, you know, the single thread approach uh, for the correct data set uh, may beat some of the 128 core implementations. It may not. Uh, you know, for the uh, Twitter RV data set, uh, it's not as good as GraphLab, but is better than all the rest. Uh, and for uh, the UK 2705 one, it's not as good as GraphX, but is better than the others, sometimes a lot better. You know, take a look at Spark in that table. And for label propagation to fixed point, so graph connectivity check, uh, then uh, the, in the Twitter RV data, it's, uh, well, the single thread is actually the best of all of them. Uh, and uh, same thing for the UK 2007 uh, data set, uh, in which case the you know, 8,000 seconds plus suggests to me that actually they gave up and they said it took too long, we quit. Um, yeah, so uh, what, do we, uh, what do we learn? Well, uh, sometimes uh, the overheads are really important. Uh, and we mentioned uh, way back when talking about parallelization that uh, with the, you know, the image of the guy with the giant carry-on uh, where he says it's going to fit in the overhead bin, that overheads are frequently ignored, but they aren't necessarily um, okay to ignore. Um, when we have you know, N systems and they all have to communicate with each other you know, then communication grows exponentially you know n squared uh, and it is sometimes just you know not better than having it done you know in a competent single core implementation uh, and we have some data to show it and so the takeaways uh, that I want you to give, uh, I want you to get from this are, you know, we say we can improve algorithms for uh, additional performance, but you know, that's kind of hard to teach. 
Um, so, you know, it's not about magic tricks, but it's about observing what we see uh, in a real data set. Uh, and if you're going to use a big data system for yourself, uh, make sure that it's faster than your laptop. You know, just, just saying, yeah, you know, this is a big problem and we definitely need to have four uh, servers or 10 servers or 128 cores or something isn't necessarily going to produce improvement. Uh, you do have to test that assumption. Uh, and uh, the uh, converse of that is if you're going to build a big data system for others, see that it is faster than my laptop, uh, and that is uh, verify that what you are building is going to be you know, an improvement for the people who are going to use it. Uh, just using you know, all this stuff where you say, you know, oh, I read on the internet that you know, using the... Um, using EC2 and you know, having 50 nodes you know, will definitely improve performance. Um, you know, sounds nice, but you got to verify that that's the case. You know, prove prove that it is true before you, know, you make that decision and before you pitch that uh, to customers, investors, anything like that. You know, a little experiment uh, goes a long way in making sure that you know, this doesn't end up kind of embarrassing. If you want to take uh, another humorous look at the uh, subject of cloud computing, I really encourage you to watch this video. Uh, you know, in fact, it is mandatory to watch this video. I consider it part of the lecture content. Um, so it is part of the lecture content. You should watch this video. Uh, it is a very funny video from uh, the 2004 Monitorama uh, PDX session uh, where James Mickens breaks down everything that is wrong with cloud computing. It's a lot. He's very funny. I wish I could be half as funny as he is. Uh, and, uh, you know, it makes for a very entertaining video, which you should definitely watch.